Hey folks, this week we're talking about quantum computing and a reported break of RSA. We're gonna talk about NVIDIA, Intel, and the AI craze. We're gonna cover the WordPress drama and a whole lot more. You don't wanna miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is the Untitled Linux Show, episode 174, recorded Saturday, October 19th. We always say it wrong. Hey folks, it is Saturday and you know what that means. It's time to get geeky with Linux and hardware and software and open source and and quantum. Yeah, we're going to talk quantum computing today too. Um, It is not just me, of course. We've got here today, we've got Ken on this side. Let's see. I'm I'm too used to the mirrored thing. We got Ken (laughs) on this side and we got Jeff on that side. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, and we're going to start by talking about something that we sort of talked about privately in one of our back channels over the week. And that is, I forget who it was that brought it up. It may have been Jeff that started. Did you hear, did you hear that they broke RSA with quantum computers? It's like, no, I had not heard about this. So I went and I looked into it and, uh, actually wrote about it for Hackaday and, uh, if you go and read the Hackaday article, the one that I've got linked, you will quickly discover, especially if you read the comments, that quantum computing is not my area of expertise. Um, but if you also read the comments, you'll find out that it's not any of the commenters' area of expertise either. And as you go and you read some of the coverage, news coverage on this, you will find out that it's not very many people's areas of expertise because there's a lot of questions about, did these researchers break AES? Did they break RSA? Did they break anything? What bit size did they break? What does this actually mean? Um, I spent some time this week reading into all of this, and I actually went and I actually read the paper. Um, I know this is kind of crazy, and not everybody can say that they did this. Uh, the paper is mostly in Chinese, but they've got quite a bit of English at the beginning of it that gives at least the overall journey of what they did. And it is interesting. Like, this is not nothing. It is interesting work. It's good work. It, it, it is work that moves forward the progress on quantum computing. So, first off, I want to say that. I'm not looking to, to um, d- belittle or demean the work that is done here. It is actually good work. Um, but it is not the end of cryptography as we know it, as some people sort of seem to think that uh, quantum computing is destined to be. So what they did is, first off, first off, we have to talk about quantum computing itself. You have two different types of quantum computers. You've got kind of this generic general purpose quantum computer, and then you have something called an annealing quantum computer, and they work differently. Um, The general purpose quantum computer, that's the one where you can actually run like quantum algorithms. If you're familiar with the idea of Shor's algorithm, S-H-O-R apostrophe S, written for Dr. Shor, the guy that invented this. Shor's algorithm, that is the one that said that that predicts, and I think it's been fairly well mathematically proven that this will actually work, that you can practice you can factor numbers into their primes very, very rapidly, much more rapidly than what a classical computer can do. And that's something that runs on a general purpose quantum computer. The problem with general purpose quantum computers is that they are ext- they, they exist, but they're extremely limited in the number of qubits is the term that you see used, quantum bits. Um, and there is there is some some thought, and this is kind of my thought personally, that there will always be okay, so with with qubits to be able to get them to do something um, useful, they all have to be in sync. The, the, the term coherence gets tossed around, and all the qubits have to be like cohered together. They have to be in sync at the same time. Um, someone someone that I was reading after this this week uh, suggested it was sort of like you have a handful of marbles and you drop them all, and they all have to for it to do something useful. They all have to bounce at exactly the same time. And you can imagine that, well, if you have two marbles, it's fairly easy to drop them at the exact same time and they all bounce. But as you scale that up, if you have like 100 marbles, then that becomes an increasingly difficult problem. Um, And so just kind of an aside, my thought on this is we may find out that building a quantum computer and actually getting a quantum computer to properly cohere at the level that we need it to with, with large qubit size that may be a hard problem. I don't mean hard like like what you normally think of as difficult, but like mathematically speaking, that may be a hard problem. And so 
RSA and cryptography may in the long term actually be safe because what you're doing is you're actually swapping one hard problem for another hard problem. That is that is a freebie. That's just sort of my my opinion. Um, and we'll see. History may prove me wrong. As we say, quantum computing is always 10 years out. So maybe maybe in another 30 years, we'll actually have something that works. Uh, so you have, you have that as the classical form of quantum computing. You also have this, what they call quantum annealing, which that's the idea that you shake it up. Uh, so it has qubits as well, but they, they don't, they, they're like intentionally not all um, synced up quite the same way. What they do is it, it's like they shake it, they shake the state of it up and then they watch what happens as the state settles. And so you get to this point to where like in a quantum, quantumly speaking, um, all of these different bits kind of settle to their lowest possible state. And you get some interesting quantum effects through that. And so like that's, that is in and of itself a, an interesting thing that you can do with quantum. So that's what D-Wave does. D-Wave makes these quantum annealing machines. And they're fascinating. Um, and it's a different branch of study. And one of the things that's being done right now, because like the, the, the error states and the, the sync problem, uh, it's much easier to solve in a quantum annealing machine. It's easier to work around. But what people are now trying to figure out is like, what practical purposes does a quantum annealing machine have? Because it can't run these general purpose problems like Shor's algorithm. And so what these researchers did is they said, well, let's look at RSA and find out, is it even possible to break RSA with one of these quantum annealing computers? And the answer is yes, and they did it. The, the catch is that they did it with a 22-bit key. And the like the smallest um I, I made the statement in the article that the smallest key that you actually see in real use is 1024 bits and the commenters were like by the way nist has already said you should not be using a 20 or 1024 bit key actually the smallest you're ever supposed to use now is a 2048 bit key and the difference between a 22 a 22 bit key and a 1024 bit key you have to keep in mind it's it's not a linear progression of difficulty it's actually like it's it's parametric it it um it the, the difficulty ramps up dramatically like for every bit you're not increasing but you're doubling the difficulty of doing it so there's a huge difference between the difficulty of a 22 bit key and a 1024 bit key and when you're talking about quantum computers, especially with Shor's algorithm, the thing that matters is that when you're doing this factoring and you expect the difficulty to, to, to ramp like that, with Shor's algorithm, the difficulty does not ramp. It is more like a linear difficulty. And so you can get from 22 bits up to 1024 bits much, much easier than you would expect to with classical computing. And the big question, and this, this paper does not answer this question, the big question with D-Wave annealing computers is even with these clever ways that they have to do, um, to do factoring and to, to, to do RSA, is the difficulty going to ramp linearly or is it going to be, again, a curve? Is it going to be an exponential curve where you, know, you can do a 22-bit key and that's fine, but you're never going to be able to do a 124-bit key with it? And that's unclear. Um, the researchers have suggested that the math, the math says that it, is not expon or that it is exponential and it's not going to be linear. Um, people that are selling these computers say, no, 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 that's not the case. It's, it's unclear. We're going to have to wait some more time. Some more work's going to have to be done on it. Um, but again, to, to put this into perspective, you can literally factor, you can break a 22-bit RSA key by hand on pen and paper. And in fact, on one of the Reddit threads that I was reading, someone, someone did that. They're like, here are the numbers that you have to know to be able to break this. Figure out which one your big key divides into and you've broken it. And it was, it was actually pretty impressive work. So, yes, neat stuff going on with quantum. No, you don't need to be worried about it yet. <laughs> well, and that was pretty much when we were talking in the background that we 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 agreed on that it's no, nothing to worry about yet. It's it's a ways off. Quantum computers are going to be great for handling analog problems. This one, this particular one, the the annealing computers, are, they are basically analog computers. Yes, from from what I understand, that is essentially what is going on. And it's uh, like I said, it's unclear to me that the the sky is ever going to fall because of quantum computing. Obviously, people have to prepare that it might, um, but time will tell. It, it, it's one of those things where like it's it's always ten years out, 
it's always 10 years away. And then I'm sure we're all going to wake up one day and it's like a surprise. Here's a paper that just showed that it's possible. Or here's a new computer we built that, that is a thousand times more powerful than anything else ever has been. They, those sorts of things sneak up on you. Yeah, but I think we're, we'll get into the 10 years away and then we'll get into a, oh, it's three years away. Uh, it's one year away. But each one of those is going to iterate several times. So when we're even, oh, it's about a year out. Yeah, okay, so, we'll see it in maybe a decade. You know, I guess and, you could say a good analogy is we're back to the 8-bit days with quantum computing. Uh, if even the 8-bit days. We're, it, we're more like in 4-bit. And, and the thing with the computer stuff back then, standard computer, it scales so easily. Mm-hmm. You can just keep adding iterations. But with the quantum computing, there's so many of those qubits you have to have to basically double check what your other ones did you know you've you've got to have more marbles kind of double checking what you did that it's it's not a linear progression where that Mm -hmm. four bit oh you just take that and you can actually just stamp another one now you have an eight bit machine Mm -hmm. i mean a little more complexity but it's not that much greater yeah yeah, that's that's fair. Like so, like with with designing processors, in in some of those circuits, you can literally just glue two of them side by side. You can take two four bit chips and it just c- connect a couple of pins together and glue them side by side, and you've got an eight bit chip. And it's a it's a very different yep. ball game in quantum. Yeah, uh, I've I've done uh, I've had some processor design classes, and mm-hmm. I've I've I actually designed a processor in college. Now, super simple, you know, just add, subtract, some basic functionality. It wasn't, you know, it, nothing, nothing commercial. But yeah, mm-hmm. that's a lot of it. You, you design one part and then you just start chunking them together. And that's, you know. So this is, this is a total sidetrack. This is a total rabbit trail. But if that sort of thing sounds fun to you, I have a book recommendation, actually. I don't have it here with me because I have, I have lent it to a teenager that is interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, NAND to Tetris, N-A-N-D to Tetris is a book that is literally, well, it's a college course, but it's also a textbook that is literally about assuming you only have NAND circuits, let's step through building your own processor, building your operating system, building a language, and then making the game Tetris in that language. And then there's also some like add-ons to this where people have said, well, let's do it in a real FPGA. Let's do it in a real FPGA with only open source tools. And uh, it is it is an amazing, I've gone partway through the course, um, and it is really, really neat. So if that's something that really tickles your fun bone, NAND to Tetris is something to look into. So yeah, that's, That sounds pretty cool. It, it is cool. It's a lot of fun. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Caliber. I have been told it's not Calibre. It is Caliber. I think this is, well, I think it's one of those words where there's more than one way to spell it. Uh, but Ken, you have the, the scoop on Caliber, don't you? Yes, I do. And this week, Marius Nista wrote about my favorite cross-platform ebook management software. He said developer COVID Goyal has released version 7.20 of Caliber. And according to COVID, on the the Caliber website, it is pronounced as Caliber, not Calibre. Calibre. (laughs) In fact, I've got a link in the show notes to uh, where he talks about that. But I am going to touch on some of the highlights of this new release. First, we have a new default dedicated PDF input engine that features automatic detection and removal of headers and footers based on document analysis. The old PDF input engine used by Caliber is still available, and you can switch between the new one and the old one in the PDF input section of the conversion dialog down through preferences. In fact, I was playing with that. The old one says PDF to HTML when you select it, by the way. Uh, Caliber 7.20 also updates the Kobo driver to support the new firmware used by the Tolino Shine 5 ebook reader released last April. It also updates the trim image tool with a new control that lets users adjust the aspect ratio of images and improves the read aloud feature by allowing users to configure an extra pause at the end of every sentence when using 
the Piper text-to-speech engine. I found playing with it that the max increase that you can do is a two-second pause. I also played around with the read aloud feature using a section from the uh, book by Mark Twain, Tom Sawyer. I actually found it hilarious to hear it read extremely fast, <laughs> then go with a two-second pause between sentences. And you do have several voices to choose from. Uh, for those of though, you that have a large ebook uh, collection in cal caliber, you may find it uh, convenient to use this uh, read along uh, feature to uh, create your own audio books uh, mm -hmm. to take with you when you're driving. Just play with the voices there. Now, for the PDF output engine, it has also been updated as well in Caliber 7.20 with support for the underscore width underscore pixels underscore and the underscore height underscore pixels underscore and these are variables by the way to know the width and height of the header and footer area in templates several bugs were addressed in this new caliber update to improve the content server these include an issue where embedding the server html inside a third-party iframe caused an error and it also addressed an issue where books with non-ASCII file names couldn't be downloaded in the Kindle browser when using the mobile view. I can see where that could be very difficult. <sighs> Caliber 7.20 also fixed an issue with the Read Aloud Piper's backend, preventing it from working on, what's this Windows system they were talking about? <laughs> with voices that have non-ASCII characters in their names, and a regression from the previous release that broke the ability to copy a book to another library if the book author doesn't exist in the destination library. I'm glad I skipped over that version. <laughs> if you use Caliber to download news from various sources, then I'm going to recommend reading Marius's article or the changelog for more details about the new improved news sources. Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting tool. I, I like the fact that it has the uh, you know the 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 voices and all of that. Um, it's it's pretty cool, um, and, it, and it has a very active uh, community of uh, developers for its mm -hmm. add-ins, plugins. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, would love to hear either covid or maybe one of the uh, plugin authors on floss weekly at some point in the future that's a good idea i can make a note about that um i have to, I have to tease him about uh, making prog a program that is called calibre uh, <laughs> that'll be fun yes. well, <laughs> if, if one thing were consistent we always say it wrong <laughs> we always say it wrong well there's the yeah. show title right there we yeah. always say it wrong yeah. Oh. All right, Jeff, let's talk about Plasma. We know how to pronounce this one at least. Uh although yeah. apparently hardware is hard. Yes, that That's that's uh according to Nate Graham. So KDE Plasma 6.2 is out. Woohoo. Well, okay, it's not really new news as it came out on the 8th of October with a bunch of bug fixes and polish, so it's not this week's main news. And the, that was the plan that it was going to have all these bug fixes, polish. Well, 6.2 had some regressions and 6.2.1 and 6.2.2 are coming out, which helped fix some of the problems that reared their head with the latest release. I don't know how widespread some of those 0.1, 0 0.2 are going to be, or if they're going to jump straight to 0 0.3, we'll, we'll see what it is. I mean, it, it's in the background, but I don't know if it'll actually hit official distributions if you're not running the beta. Anyway, the link to Nate Graham's weekly blog, you know, as as Jonathan said, has the title of this week. We, this week in plasma, hardware is hard. So that's what that's what he said. And you know, he said the hardest part is the diversity in the hardware that people have. You know, if you look at the last, we'll just say seven years of CPUs, for example, and then you take all the motherboards that you know come along with all that, with every GPU in that time range, you know, discrete and internal, you know, mix them all together. 
you know, and that's not even counting all the different distributions there are. So there's a lot of combinations and, you know, you realistically can't test that because you just have to, that's why they have betas. So you can just put it in the wild and just trying to get all the bugs out of it. Well, plasma is moving fast and a lot of bugs are squashed in 621 and 622. And more features are coming and being worked on in 6.3. So you've got multiple versions building off, off of each other. So just to get everybody up to speed, first of all, we have a few of the bugs that were fixed in 621 and they fixed three plasma crashes affecting the system tray and disks and devices widget under various circumstances, fixed a case where plasma would crash in brightness related code, fixed a bug that caused configuration pages of the system monitor widgets to not be scrollable when needed. And that's just a, there's a ton more fixes in 621. I just, I just touched on the major ones and a lot of the crashes there. There's a lot of little paper cuts they fix that I'm not going to go over, you know, something, you know, you open a, you open a, a drop down or something and it's, it's offset from where it should be or something like that. That's uh, not, not a total deal breaker using the system, just a, a paper cut as we call it. Uh, 6.2.2 brings the following fixes where they fixed a regression that would cause the cursor to misbehave in certain video games, fixed two visual issues in Breeze GTK4 theming, fixed a regression that caused HDR to stop working properly in games that request absurd, absurd brightness levels, you know, like a billion nits of brightness. I'm assuming that the, the games either had bad coding or they said, turn it up as bright as it'll go. Let's just put in a billion. <laughs> fixed an issue that caused uh, visual distortion in the clipboard widgets config window when interacting with it in a, a specific way. And, you know, 6.2.2 6 has more fixes, but not any crashes and just more odd window behavior in spe specific situations that they fixed. Now, 6.3 has some goodies coming as well. So now it's possible to customize the pressure curve for drawing tablet pens. So you can, you know, you artists out there will, you have that force uh, that you can use on your pens. So you can, you can make your uh, artistic lines better by, by you can tweak it now. Uh, improving the way pop-ups using the sliding pop-ups effect slide out of floating plasma panels, panels. Uh, the Plasma Digital Clock widget now displays all events on days with more than five events, making it actually useful for that use case now. Uh, Plasma's Power and Battery widget now shows better placeholder text when you're managing power using TLP instead of Power Profiles daemon, or when Power Profiles daemon is installed but not supported by the device's firmware. Many more features are coming, but if you notice, there are not a, any bug fixes yet in 6.3, and those will come later as we have to get the 6.2 series all released so they can see what needs fixed and what fixes took care of what issues. Just to give a status update, the overall picture is currently, and this is by Nate's latest blog, we have four very high priority plasma bugs, which are up from two last week, 33 15 minute plasma bugs down from 35 last week. And for those that don't remember the 15 minute plasma bugs, those are bugs that a new user would would notice in the first 15 minutes of using the operating system. So that's, that's why it says 15 minute. It's, it's the quick little, Hey, that doesn't seem right kind of things. But while the, you know, it seems like there's a lot of bugs, 143 KDE bugs of all kinds were fixed in the last week. So there's, there's a lot of work going on to make this, uh, make this smooth. And, you know, so while some people might, think that, like I said, KD, KDE Plasma 6 is a little rough around the edges. They're working hard to make it smooth. You know, they, they're they really trying to put some polish on it while adding all these new features and and getting it up to the, the speed of the 5 Series, which remember, I mean, the 5 Series was out for years, so they, they've come a long way in a short amount of time. Um, you know, if you're at all curious, I'd give it a shot. Myself, I'm on 6.1, and while I have noticed a few paper cut issues, there isn't anything major stopping anything I'm doing on the computer. Uh, if you're really curious, you know, for those that didn't listen, maybe you're new, check out last week's show, and I went over my adventure into KDE 6.1. You know, a few little hiccups, nothing nothing major. 
uh, if you're, and I don't have a link in the show notes, but I do know uh, Neon rebased to, to uh, 6.2 based on the 24.04 release of Ubuntu. So if you want to see what the KDE developers are playing with, that's that's a good way to take a look. But take a look at the show notes for full details on everything. And it's got links to all the bugs, the open ones, the fixed ones, all the the logs, the notes, the code, everything you'd ever want to see. So give it a, give it a shot. Let it, let's hear what you think. Yeah, I would. Uh, I see somebody in in our Discord is talking about how well there's still bugs. That seems a little scary. Maybe it's not ready. I would say give it a shot. Uh, I would even recommend something like the Fedora 41 beta would be a great place to go give KDE a test run because you know they're going to be a very up to date kernel, a very up to date KDE release, um, and that's that's. I've run that on some machines and I've had great success with it. Um, so I'd say give it a shot and see if it works for you. Try it on your yeah. Delhi system. Well, I mean, if you don't want to do, jump in to the deep end of the pool, you can you can run it off of an ISO. You can put it on another machine, put it on a laptop you don't use very often. You yeah. know, there's lots of options. Yeah, virtualize. Yeah. Although a lot of goodness, a lot of uh, systems do not do well. A lot of new desktops do not do well with virtualization because so many of them need hardware uh, acceleration these days. You know, there's several people ran into problems on uh, on Cosmic, the new Cosmic desktop, the beta that they put out of that, because they're you know the, you don't generally have any hardware acceleration in your in your virtual machines. So, yeah, I, I, I like to run it on bare metal when I when I play with something. I just either throw an old drive in or mm -hmm. partition something just to dual boot kind of thing and just have fun with it. And you know it. It's, I wouldn't worry about it for a daily driver if it's not a mission critical machine or something that you're really panicked on. And if you, if you say, oh, I got to roll it back. Okay. It's not a, a huge deal. Mm -hmm. It's, I would go ahead and go for it. If, if you're mission critical or you just like, I cannot take any downtime, I cannot, eh, it might be a little rough yet, but you're probably going to stay on LTS anyway. You wouldn't go to 2410 or Indeed. you wouldn't go to, fedora 40 you would you know mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna stay away from that kind of stuff anyway yep yep that is fair all right well let's talk about uh another release this this yeah this was this week i think and that's our door 8.9 no wait 8.10 um <laughs> so <laughs> we just talked about 8.8 .8. .8. what is going on here well i did a little bit of digging into this and uh, 8.9 got released because there were a couple of major issues with 8.8. .8. Uh, people were getting crashes, random crashes that were caused by, it says in these release notes, a subtle change in how waveforms were drawn introduced in 8.8. .8. Uh, it also turned out that MIDI notes, inter uh, MIDI notes immediately at the start of playback were ignored. Both sort of, sort of problems. So both of those got fixed with 8.9, and then in 8.9, they found uh, some more problems. And they say here that uh, there were a couple of new major issues. Uh, scheduling of disk input-output threads, which tended to be very system-dependent, but there were very real problems on the some systems where this particular problem occurred. Uh, and then um, importing SMF MIDI via drag and drop now uses the file name once again. Content slipping a region now correctly causes an update of the playback buffers, so you can hear the results as expected. Just some some little irritating problems. I guess some of them were more than just little, but some irritating problems that slipped into 8.9, and so now there's an 8.10. And uh, it's it's funny, once again, this is once again intended to be the last release of the 8.x series. And the release notes here says that our Git repository is now at 9.0-pre-0. Um, and you might you might be thinking, what's going on with our door? Why have they had like four releases in a row now where they've had problems? They've had to do hot fixes. Uh, why, why have we been on the 8.0 series for so long? And there is actually in the Ardor discourse in their kind of community forums, uh, Paul Davis throws out a reasonably long blog post talking about that. And there are a couple of things that have been happening behind the scenes. Um, and one of those is actually that they have been doing the uh, sort of the commercial version, um, Bixbus. 
And they've been working on, I think it was a 10.0 release from Mixbus. And there were, um, yeah, Harrison Mixbus 10. And there were some big things that landed in that, uh, one of which being Dolby Atmos support. And not all of that stuff, particularly with Dolby Atmos, because of licensing and patents and all kinds of stuff, that doesn't make it back into our door. And so they sort of took a, you could call it a break from our door. That's not exactly what it was, but they spent more of their time. So Paul Davis and Ant X42, they both spent a good portion of their time doing this stuff. And then there's also things in the background of our door that they have been sort of refactoring. Um, they call they talk about piano rule, which they sort of took all of the MIDI stuff and abstracted it away so that you could they could use it anywhere without doing code duplication. And of course, that sort of refactoring work always takes a while and doesn't have a whole lot of immediate benefits. Um, and then one of the other interesting things that they talked about here was a new DAW digital audio workstation that is focused on front of house operations. And so this is from it, it looks like that they are doing a sort of another version of our door that is going to be just for uh, live recording, maybe live audio, live playback, but mainly live recording is what it appears to be. It's not going to have any MIDI support. It's not going to do plugins. It's going to be much, much simpler than what all of our door gives you right now, because boy, there's a lot that's in our door, the full blown version of it. And so they're, they're kind of looking at this and, and, scaling it down to what makes more sense in a live setting um so live setting is front of house live setting yeah front of house so the the term the term house is i think it's originally a a theater term You, you have you've you might have heard the term stage left and stage right well stage is the stage house is the audience and so when you're talking about front of house, you're talking about the sound system that exists at the front of the audience. So like your big speakers that are pointed back towards the audience, that's the front of house system. Um, I didn't know it. I've, I've always heard it as a restaurant term. That's <laughs> yeah, different, different. Um, so anyway, they're, they're working on that. And so there's a, there are a lot of these things that have been happening in the background of our door and just have not paid, paid off for everybody yet. But it sounds like they have made their way through that and now they are kicking it for 9.0 in earnest. I'm definitely looking forward to see uh, how it handles MIDI after they finish that. Yeah, you know, MIDI has been MIDI has been good in our door for a long time, but they are uh, th- they're making that MIDI editor a lot more um usable in different places, which I think is going to open up some very interesting things in 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 various places like the, the the clip right like so one of the things that you can do that's it's reasonably new in our door is the ability to do clip editing and playback of clips um so like you could put together a you could put together a song that's entirely based on clips and so now you can grab something like i've got one here actually you can grab something like this which is just, it's a pad with a whole bunch of different buttons on it. And you could program one of these. So, okay, when I push this button, this particular drum fill starts playing. And then when I hit this button, we're going to do a chord structure. And I hit this button and this particular synth riff will start. Well, then I hit this button and the synth riff stops. I hit this other button, we go to a different drum fill. And so you can literally put together a song with just the different combinations. And so you, there are YouTube videos of people doing this, by the way, just, just building a song based out of loops, right? And so it's that idea inside of our door. One of the things that's been a problem, it's been kind of clunky. I won't say it's a problem, but it's been clunky in our door is building is particularly the MIDI version of those loops of those clips in real time. Because what you have to do is you have to like go to your main editor, record the clip there, and then grab it and move it over to your clips library and then put it onto one of the buttons. And it's just, it's clunky. And so I'm hoping that one of the things that they're looking to do with this is give people the ability to work with all of this a a bit more easily. And I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be cool. I I enjoy fiddling around with our door. I get it, you know, from time to time, I'll do all of the connections and hook it up to, I've got the the modular synth with some MIDI stuff in it and all kinds of fun stuff. It's fun. Pretty neat. It is. It's fun. All right. Let's talk about, oh, a new version of Clonezilla, Ken. Uh, Yes. And I do recommend using this before you try out uh, Plasma. <laughs> yeah. But with, I uh, do want to first off start off by thanking both Bobby Borisov and Marius Nestor 
for informing us about developer Stephen, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, Xiao, Xiao's release of Clonezilla Live version 3.2 this week. If you are unfamiliar with Clonezilla, Bobby's article gives a brief description of Clonezilla and the task that it may be used for. So we'll just move straight to what is new in version 3.2. Clonezilla Live version 3.2 provides a range of major enhancements and bug fixes. One of the key changes, according to Bobby, is upgrading the underlying OS. The new release is based on Debian SID repository, with the updates taken as of July 15, 2024. For those of y'all that aren't familiar with Debian SID, it's basically the test version of Debian. And uh, basically what uh, Stephen's doing is just taking a snapshot and using what was in the uh, Debian set as of that time to base uh, Clonezilla on. Now, Clonezilla Live version 3.2 also provides users with better hardware support by bumping the kernel to Linux 6.11. Changes in this release include merging ZSTD and ZSTDMT compression utilities and to include using ZSTD space dash capital T zero by default. I'll let y'all look research and find out what that actually does. <laughs> now, this will make it easier for users to customize it using boot parameters. Clonezilla Live 3.2 also updates the OCS-scan-disk utility to use LSBLK or Lisp block and to show a block device with the file system correctly. It also updated the OCS-live-v-img utility to add the messing-edio option. The OCS on the fly utility to disable the dash J2 and dash E2 options by default when running OCS dash SR and the live config package to support the user crypted boot parameter. Other changes include allowing the percent symbol in the auto name format of the image name in the text mode user interface when saving an image. It improves the batch mode to quit, quit when failing to restore a partition and replaces the reboot option with system control dash F reboot to prevent root over network file system from hanging when rebooting. Clonezilla Live 3.2 removed two packages that are not lo no longer available in the package repository. The first is the wireless pack, wireless tubes package. And the second one is the riser for progs package. As some of y'all may remember, the riser for progs package was actually deprecate, deprecated upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, we covered that the last change made by SUSE's uh, Jankara that was merged as part of the Linux FS merge to the uh, Linux uh, 6.10. You can go back to the uh, May time frame and you'll find where we discussed that. Mm -hmm. As always, there are more details available from Bobby and Marius' article, as well as links to the official website. And uh, you can also follow from the official website to the GitHub, where if you're really curious about all these uh, options and uh, functions that he's talking about in the mm -hmm. article you can dig through there to find out more yeah good stuff uh for those of us that run um something like um my mind is entirely gone blank on the name of the application that lets you put a whole bunch of isos on a, a flash drive um, ventoy yeah ventoy thank you um it, it is time to go and grab the new iso and give it a test right so whenever you get a new distro like an update to your distro with ventoy make sure and give it a test before you need it I have been I have been stuck a time or two because you know uh, in my case it was a new Fedora release did something new and fun and Ventoy didn't have an update for it yet and 
uh, on that particular occasion, I had to boot into Windows to fix my Linux distribution, which nobody ever wants to have to do that. Oh, for shame. I know. <laughs> uh, well, I would test it is to set up uh, one of them for as a make two copies of it put one on a system that you've been thinking about moving to a vm and then another one on a system and actually have it or boot it up uh, as within a vm and run it from there so mm -hmm. that you can just copy that use clonezilla to copy from the uh, bare metal into a vm yeah yeah, that could certainly work. Yeah, I was going to say too. I was like, I thought we just talked about Clonezilla, and so I I looked in the article and they're like, oh yeah, three is it three one three came out just three months ago. So they're they're really uh, mm -hmm. very active on the updates and the new releases. Yeah, pushing these out quite uh, quite rapidly, which is which is good. I mean, nobody yeah, yeah. wants super old tools hanging around. It just it tends How not to work on new hardware and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. How long ago did uh, six point eleven come out for uh, the Linux kernel? That was that's been very recent, within the last three or four weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's moving up there quick. Yeah, yeah. I was I was impressed to see that. Now, one thing with six eleven is it's not one of the long term kernels. It's only going to be supported for a, a few months. Um, but I guess at the speed that they do updates at Clonezilla, that's not going to be a problem. Correct. All right. Well, one of the things Ken mentioned was support for new file systems. And uh, I think Jeff has the down low on yet another file system. It's not really new anymore, but what's new no, with OpenZFS? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's been a while since we've checked in with OpenZFS. And I want to start with clearing up something in the name. So this is going to be a greatly simplified account of the history, but it, it <laughs> helps clear some things up. <clears throat> so ZF, ZFS started with Sun Microsystems, and later in the life, they uh, Sun opened it up to open. They said, it's okay, this is open source. Well, later, Sun was purchased by Oracle, and Oracle closed the code for ZFS. So the last version of the open source code was forked, and the Open Solaris project continued to develop the code. Well, there was OpenZFS and ZFS on Linux, and long story short, in 2020, ZFS on Linux was merged into the BSD OpenZFS, and now they share a unified code base for both platforms. Um, so it, when we say ZFS, like on Linux, it's OpenZFS is the official what it is, because Oracle keeps developing ZFS on their own behind closed doors. So the code base is diverged a little bit. I mean, it... Maybe the features are the same, but how they're coded is could be very different just because Oracle, you know. <laughs> because Oracle. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to make sure when people like, well, wait, ZFS, this is open ZFS. What is it? Open ZFS is what we're running in Linux. So which brings us today where we have open ZFS 2.3 release candidate two. And that was just released. Now, it's only been a couple of weeks since they had release candidate one, which brought support for Linux kernel 6.11. Funny we were talking about that. Uh, 2.3 in general brings direct IO to bypass the ARC, which is adaptive replacement cache, which increases the efficiency of the transfer of data. It can also handle now handle directories and file names with 1,023 characters. Uh, it's also got RAID-Z expansion support has been added, which allows a person to grow a RAID-Z pool without needing to take the RAID down. And fast deduplication has been added as well. And they're saying that's a major performance increase when you're trying to deduplicate your, your files. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the article, the show notes, they have a table showing some of the improved performance by where they optimize the kernel same page memory and the optimate optimizations and optimize CPU pinning because it can cause, cause small delays when a task has to jump from CPU to CPU. And we've, in this show, have talked about how there's a delay with one C, even one CPU. If you only have one CPU in your system and you've got to jump from node to node, especially when the cache a core is using is attached to another node. Now it's all behind the scenes, but there's more latency when you have to jump to a further away uh, section or when you're moving your, uh, your thread from one core to another. So they try to optimize it and 
keep everything efficient by pinning down that uh, that ta that thread. Now, sure, it's only you know maybe just a few nanoseconds, but when it's getting hit, you know, millions of times, it slows things down. They did run a benchmark with a with the ZFS test suite. And the best improvement was from Alma Linux 8, which took about 36 minutes out of the three hour and 42 minute test. Uh, you know, there was a few that optimizations didn't improve the time, but they were worse by maybe a minute or two. I mean, it, it very close. So, you know, when you're running like a three and a half hour plus test, a minute difference or less than a minute, that's eh, pretty much a wash. So it really isn't gonna hurt you the performance is going to hurt you, but a lot of cases it really helps quite a bit. Uh, in the article in the show notes, we have a link to the GitHub page where you can get the full list of the bug fixes that have been taken care of in, in the different RCs, like in, in the article in the show notes, it's for RC2. And just from RC1 to RC2, there's 21 fixes that they've got listed in there. So take a look at the article for the in the show notes because it's got up details for the upcoming 2.3 release the 2.3 release candidate one release candidate two and it's got all the open zfs goodness you could ever ask for in there yeah so is is open zfs i, I know we've talked about this it's open zfs that will not make it into the linux kernel right yeah there's some licensing hiccups yeah. so that's why it gets loaded in later Mm -hmm. because it's, I can't remember the license it's under, but it's not technically compatible. I don't. Yeah, the, there's, yeah, there's questions. And I think there's also questions about whether it's like entirely freely under that license because Oracle never entirely, or Sun entirely, never entirely signed off on it. it gets into complicated legal licensing stuff. Um, but it's, it's not in the kernel because of that, but I know a lot of people really like it. Um, I was well, doing a little bit of looking here and open ZFS, not only is a file system, it's also the logical volume manager. It, it will replace LVM and does all of that right inside of, uh, open, mm -hmm. open ZFS. And, so, and, uh, M that M D A D M as well with the raid. Because it does raid, raid stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's, it's does a lot of heavy lifting in industry. Mm -hmm. So it's a very secure stable file i mean people mm -hmm. people trust it you know and yeah. and it's and part of it too is the amount of features that it has built in you mm -hmm. know and with with the average user i don't think you're probably going to notice anything and if you have lvm or mdadm running a raid yeah it's not all combined into one program but you're not at the redundancy level that a lot of enterprise has to have because if you're right. like well i got to have the most secure solid thing well then you better be running multiple power supplies you better have ups generator backup mm -hmm. you know hardware that fails over to another raid i mean that's <laughs> you know you, you can't it, it's kind of silly to say i've got to have the most stable file system but you're running it on a cheap generic drive that you know <laughs> you know you got some ebay thing you put together it's like well you, you're not you're not getting the full equation there <laughs> And, and going back to your licensing a bit, I know in the article too, they talked about how the, does the Oracle issue matter as much anymore? Because they've talked about, we've had several years where the, the code base has probably diverged more because so much has been changed in the open versus what's in the Oracle. You know, how close are they anymore? I mean, nobody knows, but it, right. it, it was kind of thrown out that maybe things will change someday, but I wouldn't hold my breath. It works to load it it's, in later I, I i took a look on another project i another project is gpl v3 and we we looked into the idea of adding an exception for a particular use case and it's like well this is technically not something that it's not something that is already granted by the gpl it would be an exception on top of the gpl it, it's the linking exception right it's the same thing that the kernel does um but it's like, this is not something that the original author signed off on. So start looking at, okay, what would it take to figure out whose source code is actually in here? And so you could do things like a git blame and find the different names. But then you get to looking at those git blame logs. And some of those are where someone just added a tab to change the indention. And it's like, well, that's not a transformative enough change for it to be a new copyright owner. And so 
all of that to say, trying to untangle the history of a project to get the owners of it to sign off or to even audit it and figure out, is there any Oracle code still in here? Is there any of Sun's code still in here that they still have a copyright? That would be a monumental task. That would be a huge task. <laughs> and, and, you know, the kind of rub of it is it would have to go to the courts and mm -hmm. you never know what they're going to find. Yeah. I yep. mean, it could be a programmer's going to go, yeah, it's black and white. They're not the same. Well, that might not be what the, you know, jury of 12 come up with or whatever, or what yes. kind of arguments are made or yeah, you just, and, and, yes. and a lot of times nobody wants to pay the lawyers that much to sort it all out and correct versus, you know, it works good to load it in as a module and we'll just deal with it there. Well, it's unfortunately, on other things. unfortunately, I've got a story here where it looks like some people are dedicated to spending the money on lawyers. Oh, no. Yeah. So we got to talk about WordPress. This, this is not the first show where I've talked about something and I've told you guys I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I don't want to be talking about WordPress. Slightly different reasons, but I still don't want to be talking about WordPress. I would, I would prefer to be talking about how awesome WordPress is and how, you know, the people at Automatic are doing good work, being good stewards of it, and how that Matt Mullenweg is a show or is a, a friend of Floss Weekly. He's been on at least once, maybe a couple of times. And I think all of that is true. Um, but right now there is some major like soap opera level drama going on between WordPress and WP Engine. And it's a, it's just it's unfortunate. So essentially what has happened is WordPress, the, like the WordPress company, Automatic, the company actually, uh, owns the trademark to WordPress. And trademarks are interesting because one of the things with trademarks is it's sort of, it's sort of been decided by the courts mostly, but also by some legal things, um, that in order to keep a trademark, you have to defend it. And you can't just let people use your trademark. Because if you just let people, you know, without any formality to it, if you just let people use it, then the courts will eventually find that you're not defending your trademark and therefore this trademark goes away. That's essentially what will happen. Um, and so on one hand, companies are required when they have a trademark, they are required to actually be somewhat assertive about the trademark and not allow people to just use it. They, there has to be trademark grants when people get to use it. And otherwise, people really are not supposed to use the trademarks. Okay. Automatic has the WordPress trademark. And the question here at the core of this is whether the WP in WP Engine, well, obviously it refers to WordPress. Like no, nobody, nobody disputes that. The question is whether that is similar enough to WordPress for people to be confused over it. Is it a trademark violation? And in the past, and in fact, in WordPress's own guidelines, WP is not considered to be um, confusing. Like it is not closely enough related to WordPress for it to be covered by the trademark. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened to change this. I don't know that it's actually been public exactly why they have changed their stance, but Automatic has changed their stance and come out and said, no, no, WP is now. Uh, close enough to WordPress that you shouldn't use it. You should ask for permission before using it. And of course, WP Engine uses WP in part of their naming. And the argument that is being made is that people are confusing the WP Engine company with WordPress itself. And that would be a problem. That, that, would, that would be Unfortunately, that would that would be negative, and that would be something that they would have to go after for WordPress or for uh, trademark use for the WordPress trademark. Um, that rings hollow to a lot of people. The idea that WP Engine is that confusable with WordPress itself, but Automatic and Mullenweg have charged forward with this idea, um, and they they're, they're threatening legal action. Um, they've done another couple of things that are really problematic, um, like just bad ideas. Uh, for example, one of the uh, WordPress plugins that was made by people that have an association with WP Engine um, has been taken over on the WordPress store by Automatic. And um, 
that has ruffled a lot of feathers. People are not okay with that. And then one of the other things that they did that I, I, I just, I could not believe they made a, so when you go to log into WordPress, there are some buttons that you can press, right? And they added a check mark to the WordPress login that says, essentially, I do not have a business. I am not affiliated. That's the, that's the way it says. I am not affiliated with WP Engine. And I believe if you check that box, you're not allowed to log in anymore. And I am just, I, I, I can't hardly believe that they did that. Um, for one thing, I don't think that is legal. I think that is actually an antitrust violation. And uh, I believe that is literally illegal for them to do that. Um, but just from like the the open source and the community perspective, I'm flabbergasted that they would go to that length. Um, they they sent a um, they, they tried to settle right. So like Automatic sent a letter to WP Engine and said, "Hey, we will let you use the trademark if you will do this." And they gave them some things that they wanted them to do, and. They they want eight percent, right? They want eight percent of their of their their gross sales, and that seems a little onerous. But then they have an option in there. It's like, or you can, um, you can dedicate eight percent of your sales to people working on WordPress, um, at the, uh, basically what they work on to be controlled by the WordPress organization, which is not the same as automatic. Um, and and that seemed a lot more tolerable at least to me but then there's like another um uh, another stipulation in there that you won't fork and then they listed a couple of other open source projects that are like under the gpl it's like you will not fork these and it's like guys you 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 can't th- the gpl says that you can't do that like the gpl says that you cannot put that sort of restriction on your users <laughs> like th- this is not okay like you're now in violation of the gpl as well um i'm I am flabbergasted. Uh, I've got a link to Brody's video on it. And uh, he, he makes the statement that he's like, at some point, Mullenweg has to understand that what he's doing here is just totally insane. Um, but it's like, I think the guy is in too deep now and can't turn back. And I I don't know. The, the whole thing is insanity to me, reading some of these things, like the, the depths that they have gone to. It's like, not all of it is unreasonable. Like, to say, hey, we think people are confusing WP Engine and WordPress, can we do something about that? Like, that's a reasonable that's a reasonable ask. But the, the place that this has gone to is not reasonable. It is It has gone from a reasonable ask to unreasonable uh, repercussions. So, I don't know what the future is going to hold for WordPress. I hope they figure it out. I really, really hope that the people involved with this can sit down together and figure something out because what is going on now is not good for WordPress. It's not good for the open source project. And genuinely, because there are so many websites run on the internet with WordPress, like this is a thing that is not good for the internet. Um, It's not good. Let's figure it out. Let's do, let's be better. Let's be better guys. Come on. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, and you know, you you were kind of hit the nail on the head too. Some of that is you got to protect your copyright because I remember your trademark. The, yeah, yeah. This you got is to. this is probably, gosh, maybe even thirty years ago now. FMF, the motorcycle uh, parts company, Flying mm-hmm. Machine Factory, they had a uh, exhaust pipe that was called a Fat Boy. They got in trouble from Harley. Mm. because they said, well, we've already got a trademark. We got to defend this. You can't use this name. So they wound up changing the name, but it was like, nobody's confusing a dirt bike motorcycle exhaust pipe with an entire Harley Davidson motorcycle. You know, there was, but it came down to, well, we have to defend it because Mm -hmm. if we don't, then it it weakens the trademark. It weakens the legal, the legal claim to the trademark. Yeah. But yeah, there could, I don't know. At the very least, I probably would have, looked at the 8% and went, oh, well, maybe four and we'll whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what the lawyers do, right? Or a lot of those people making those contracts, you start going, no, 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 you don't take the first one thrown across the bow. You go, well, tell you what, let's blah, 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 you know? How about, and how about 2% and we don't do anything else? Mm, how about four and a half percent? You do this other thing. Yeah. And, uh, four percent, but we'll link to your website and say, we're not affiliated here. <laughs> say, what, you know, they're, you can yep. get all the little silly things and yep. yeah. Any way for a lawyer to make money. Oh yes. Uh, uh, 
egos get in the way a lot of times. Oh, uh, that's true too. Although that's usually not on the lawyer's side. Um, no, some, but- sometimes sometimes the lawyers get uh, a bit more blame than they really should because they're doing the things that they're being told to by the people paying the money. Um, well, it, it's kind of unrelated to Linux, but just a quick little story was I know of a big hydraulic dam that was going to get built and it was from a organization far away. And they said, mm-hmm. well, okay. The local people said, well, we want to put our name up here. And they said, no, you can't do that. And it shut the whole thing down. <laughs> And another faraway organization said, well, we'll let you put your name on there. You know, even though we own it, we get the power. Yeah, you can put your name on there. (laughs) Okay, it went through and it has their name on it, even though it's technically owned and the power goes to a place far away. Yeah. And it was all just, we want our name on there. (laughs) That's the only reason it fell through. Oh, that's hilarious. All right, Ken, save us. Let's talk about FWPD, something technical, <laughs> something good. And uh, something where they, they work together. Yeah. Uh, this. Well, I'm going to start off by Bobby Barsoff, Maria Snester. Thank you again for an, another informative article. This time about the latest maintenance release of FWPD version 2.0.1. Bobby and Maria, Marius both wrote about FWPD.2.0.1 release adding an API allowing the GNOME firmware graphical front end to record devices for emulate, emula, emulation, as well as support for saving the emulation tag devices to the database instead of the configuration file. This makes simulating various device scenarios easier for users and developers alike. It also makes it easier to manage and track emulated hardware over time. FWPD version 2.0.1 ensures a more seamless experience by addressing several bugs affecting users. It also provides greater flexibility for package maintainers by allowing better control of the libdrm dependency during builds. FWPD now compiles more smoothly on Android and without Git installed. This makes it easier for developers and users on diverse platforms to uh, install it and use it. FWPD version.2.0.1 also speeds up the mechanism for fetching details about local firmware archives, as well as the FWPD tool command by only loading engine features when required. Both articles contain a link to the project's GitHub page, where you can find more details about the changes. Also, look in our show notes for links to both articles, as well as to the Linux vendor firmware service, where you can search for firmware you have, so you can see if it may is uh, supported by FWPD. Yeah, very cool. Um, I, uh, I I'm particularly interested in that API. I think that could be a uh, pretty interesting. Uh, is it is it only for GNOME? Is this GNOME specific? Uh, from what I was reading in the article and looking at through the uh, GitHub. Uh, release notes that's what it sounds like at the moment so i could see where they could expand that later Mm -hmm. i mean i guess if they publish the api there's nothing that prevents somebody else from coming along and using it like kde discover yeah like kde or you know even the the store in cosmic at some point um yeah or the hyperland guys or whoever uh so cool fun stuff um jeff let okay jeff I, I, I've seen, I've seen stories about this. Um, I have on my very long, very, very long to-do list. I have a very long to-do list, by the way. I have an extremely long project to-do list. One of the things on there is on my Fedora computer behind me with the AMD card in it to try Rockim again and see if I can get it installed and see if I can get some general open AI, uh, stuff, LLM stuff like, um, 
image generation for prompts. There are a couple of open source mm -hmm. projects for doing that. <clears throat> and on my very long to-do list is to try and bring that back out and actually get it working locally rather than having to kick it off to some service on the cloud. And uh, it, it sounds like there's still being progress made on this. AMD's Rockium and all of that is it's it's still being developed, and uh, they're about to hit some big milestones, right? Yeah, I my list of stories here is the AMD Compute Corner, just because there has been a lot of news lately. So I've got three stories and actually one personal uh, tidbit in here as well. Mm -hmm. Though. Uh, people on the Discord, this won't be a surprise to because I actually typed it out early in the week, but I'll just go ahead and throw it on the podcast for those not in the club. Though you should be. Join the club. Um, AMD's been working on giving more love, actually, to their GPU compute stack. And I have, like I said, three articles going over some of the improvements. The first one is RockM looks like it's going to be soon supporting OpenCL 3.0 soon. OpenCL 3.0 came out in 2020, and NVIDIA's had support since 2021, and even Intel's been supporting it for quite a quite a few quite a long time, several years. Currently, AMD is supporting 2.1, but an AMD engineer put in the following on their GitHub ticket, so the ticket for to support 3.0. And, it, and this is a quote from him. We are currently looking into upgrading to OpenCL 3.0. Please keep an eye out for announcements, updates in the future for more details. Thanks. Now, we don't have a timeline for when this is going to happen, but it is in the works. When we know, we'll let everybody know because that's exciting news. The second story is how AMD is working on compute virtualization support for ROCKM slash HIP which just as like it sounds, they're going to allow pass-through support with the GPU to allow compute tasks. Though looking at the article, it sounds like they're going video and everything. So you could do 3D gaming in a virtual machine with your AMD hardware. They, it looks like they're going to totally open up pass-through completely for the cards. At least that's the way it sounded in the article. Nice. You know, take, take it with a grain of salt, but it seems, with, seems the, that's the way they're heading. They also mention... This isn't just the OpenCL part of the spec, but the full uh, Rock M HIP compute stack. So they're not just focusing on part of it. It's the whole thing. And they're currently working on getting this upstream. So again, I don't have a date, but there's a link in the article in the show notes to the presentation they gave at the XDC conference that just ended here in, and it was up in Montreal, Canada. It gives a much more detailed explanation on how this is all going to work, how all the different levels of the driver currently work, how they'll work after the virtualization change. Uh, for those that really like to get into the details, take a look at the article in the show notes and follow the link to their presentation because they have a lot of diagrams and graphical stack representations of how it all fits together, where everything is and how it communicates, you know, and the currently is this and will be this. And so... For the, for the hardcore programmers, it's all the details are there, or enough to at least get you started on a good general direction of it. The third article linked in the show notes is about Red Hat and how they're going to use uh, RHEL AI, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux AI. Now, this is not the operating system itself, but an initiative, initiative about building a large language models for AI, which can be used in enterprise software. So the RHEL AI now supports the ROCKM compute stack, but right now it's in a tech preview. So it's not ready for prime time quite yet. It's kind of, this is the, check this out. Let's, let's put some final polish on it. But enterprise is always much more cautious than regular consumer. Now it supports AMD Instinct MI2010 GPUs for inference tasks and then AMD Instinct MI300X GPUs for both training and inference AI workloads. So this is targeting more specifically their uh, enterprise cards, the big, big server stuff. So up to this point, Red Hat AI supported CPU loads and NVIDIA GPUs. So, you know, AMD is finally getting more into the game with this update. Now, like I said at the start here, the final note in here isn't in the show notes, but as many longtime listeners have heard me talk, I support folding at home. And for anybody that doesn't know, this is where you take your spare CPU and GPU processing power and fold proteins to try and find cures for a wide variety of issues. You know, like many types of cancer, Parkinson's, Huntington's, 
many more, all sorts of stuff. It's basically trying to find better medicine cures and understand why a lot of different uh, afflictions happen, how they stop them and things like that. Well, I'm on another forum and I'm on, on, the, on their folding team and their folding at home group. And somebody from the folding at home organization was talking about the future of the project. And they said that because AMD, they said, is throwing so many more resources at the rock M slash hip uh, software. They said they've noticed a huge increase. They're finding a lot of optimizations. And they said it should double the speed that the AMD GPUs can fold. Now, they do mention, you know, right now, AMD is still the best supported with their CUDA. But Rock in, M NVIDIA, slash, NVIDIA is still the best supported with their CUDA. Yeah, what did I say? You said AMD. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> NVIDIA. Okay. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, it, and it's right here. It says NVIDIA on the sheet. So I... <laughs> It's I'm just good. so excited about AMD. I can't say <laughs> AMD enough, you know. But AMD is still the best supported with their CUDA, but Rock M Hip is closing the gap. So it it should be much more viable in the future. I mean, if if you're getting double the performance out of it, that's a major step. And they, and I, I'm condensing a lot of what uh, he said, but I mean, basically just reaffirmed from a different point of view that, yeah, AMD is finally taking rock M and hip a lot more serious and really deciding that they've got to develop that software. If they're going to catch up to, you know, keep up with Intel and Nvidia, as far as like AI and other compute workloads. Yeah. And now he didn't have an exact date again, you know, just that stuff is coming and, some of it's going to depend on how fast they can push out some of their updates. Um, it does look very promising, though. And, you know, they AMD really, they that's the reason, you know, I, I catch a lot of flack from the other t other guys in the show here, because especially <laughs> Rob, but Rob likes to give me flack. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just ignore him. But that's one of the reasons I run an NVIDIA card is because of the compute and AMD can't be there. But if they can get this going, I would be more than happy to jump on an AMD GPU because I have currently my last couple CPUs have been AMD. I, I'm not a fan. I'll just state this clear. I'm not a fanboy of any company. I kind of just look at the existing, you know, when I make it upgrade, who's got what? Let's see what's better. Because I almost went Intel this last one, but I decided to jump on AMD. So it, it's it's looking good, and we're we're going to level the playing field a little more. So uh, definitely take a look at folding at home if you're at all curious in that. Take a look at the articles in the show notes. We have a lot of details on the various things we talked about, and overall, the AMD future is just really looking bright. Yeah, absolutely. Um like I said, I've, it's been, it's been on my to-do list for a long time and, uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll get time to go play with that and, uh, it'll, it'll be there. I, I asked a while ago, the, uh, the Fedora guys, um, I'm in a couple of, of chat rooms with them and, uh, I, I asked them like, is it possible these days to actually install uh, hip and, uh, a, you know, AMD stuff and does it actually work now? And apparently yes, enough of it's packaged that you can actually use a new Fedora. So I think that's I think that's pretty cool, um, and uh, yeah, it's definitely something to to give a, give a shot. And once they get even past the OpenCL, I mean, OpenCL 3.0 will be good, but when they actually fully get on HIP and all that, and mm -hmm. kind of go beyond OpenCL, it, well, you'll you'll also yeah. see there there are some projects out there to do things like run things written for CUDA on OpenCL, mm -hmm. and I think once those really come along and come into their own, that's when it'll it'll get even more usable. Um, I, I kind of, I don't, we need, we need Vulcan for compute. It's really yes. what we need. <laughs> which, which CUDA could turn out to be that, but I know NVIDIA is probably going to be really throwing up some walled gardens, trying to keep people off of that. But yeah. the end users want no, a single, yeah. single, inter, you know, Hey, I want to write this once and have it you run everywhere. Think NVIDIA and, would want to share. NVIDIA yeah. does not want to share. They've proven that. I mean, CUDA is a closed source thing. It is an NVIDIA only thing. Well, There's and they actually were fighting AMD a little bit about their translation code. 
Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, that is it, that is big money for Nvidia. That is big and, money for Nvidia. And kind of on a side note, Intel just had an announcement where they're really getting into AI, but they're not going to compete with Nvidia at the high end. They're going for the mid range, so they're not going to try to have the monster cards. They're going mm-hmm. for the the mid range where Nvidia is trying to compete at the high end. So mm-hmm. if AMD wants to find a piece of that market, they've got to get their compute stack running. And it all indication is that they're throwing a lot of resources at it to get it up to speed. Yeah. And it, from what I understand, it works like you can do things with it. It's just because CUDA has been so, uh, it, it, CUDA is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I mean, it's been so dominant for so long. Um, it's just, it's hard for anybody. It's hard to convince people to write stuff for OpenCL. And, you know, AMD has support for, open, for a lot of OpenCL, not, not 3.0 until here recently, of course. But um, it's just it's just such a challenge because they're coming from the, such the underdog position. And, and it's very optimized. But, you know, interestingly, the mm-hmm. folding at home person anyway. Now, so this is very limited uh, use case, we'll say. But they said when NVIDIA went from OpenCL to CUDA, they didn't have that big of a performance increase. There was some, mm-hmm. but it kind of tells you how they've been tuning their hardware and software for OpenCL already mm-hmm. just to get the most out of it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right, let's see. I think I've got, yeah, I've got one more story. This is, uh, this is something cool that is probably coming to the kernel, and uh, I thought it was really neat, so we're going to talk about it, and that is proxy execution. And so, you know, we talk a lot about things in the kernel and the idea of, of running with lower latency and being able to schedule things so that your your tasks get done more efficiently. And, of course, the people working on the kernel are interested in exactly those same things. And they've run into something where a task will get blocked. And so, you know, you have something, you, mutexes, which is a, a, a it is a way to put a lock on something and say, you know, process one locks this. No other process can touch it because process one is doing something that has to be atomic. You have to do all the entire thing, then process one will let go of it, and then everything else can use it. So mutex, whether that be a piece of hardware or a piece of memory. All right, so this is a thing that the kernel gives. It gives a way to do mutexes. What happens when a low-priority process gets a lock on something that a high priority process wants to be able to use. Well, up until this point, your system just has to wait until the low priority process gets finished with it, which in a lot of cases is not what you want to happen. Um, In some cases, it's the exact opposite of the thing that you want to happen because your low priority task is low priority and therefore takes, it, it, it does not have you know, it does not get scheduled as often. So it may take quite some time for that to get done with what it's doing. Let go of the lock of the mutex and then your high priority task can come in and get it. So that results in things like higher system latency for the tasks that you actually care about. So the patch, the thing that they're looking to add to the kernel, and apparently this has been under development for a long time because they're already up to version, they're already up to version 12 of the preparatory patches for this. (laughs) Ah, what fun. Um, but it's it, it looks like it's getting closer to actually landing, and it may it may land in the 6.13. Um, and what it does is it says, we've got a high-priority task, a high-priority process waiting for this. We're going to automatically bump the prior, temporarily bump the priority of whatever is holding the lock. It will inherit, it will become a proxy of, the higher priority task, it will get a higher priority in the task queue to be able to get done with whatever it's doing and let go of this lock so that we can get to the high priority thing faster. In in a nutshell, that is what this is. Now, it is apparently, of course, it's it's getting into the scheduler code, which is always fun and exciting and very, very complicated. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to it. Um, but I think Just like from a system usability standpoint, I think that's really cool that they're looking at doing this because it will. It will help things run faster on our machines. Um, I mean, you could see feasibly things like uh, even game frame rates get faster because of this. Uh, Obviously, it's also going to make a difference for things like automotive Linux and real-time Linux. Um, I think it's just going to be a win. I think it's pretty cool. And it's a look into sort of the, the, the nerdy technical stuff that happens down inside of the kernel. So, 
proxy execution, hopefully coming soon. Yeah, yeah that scheduling of work, it just has a lot to that. There's a, yeah, oh yes, there's a no lot to schedule. No matter what kind of work you're trying to schedule. <laughs> well, and, and honestly, kind of going back to what I, my last story, when I said I had AMD CPU, the mm-hmm. one reason I didn't go Intel was because they had the performance and efficiency cores. And at the time, the scheduler wasn't quite up to par. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I want um, even, even core, or I guess one, one core type. So it was symmetric. You didn't have the, it didn't have to, the scheduler didn't have to make uh, choices. And that's why also I didn't get a, uh, a 3D cache CPU, like a 7900 or 7950, where they had half of it had cache, half had the extra 3D cache, half of it didn't, because I would want to avoid that kind of uh, unevenness in the hardware. Now, mm. now, if it was the same thing, I very likely could have went 14700K just because the, the schedule now is pretty ironed out and they've got all the look-aheads and the feedbacks and whatnot, but just something to think about, you know. The the At the time that you would have bought that Intel chip, is that one of the chips that could have eaten itself? It, did you yes. did you really dodge a bullet there? Yeah, you really dodged a bullet maybe, by going with AMD, maybe. Very, very possibly, because it was, it was the, I was looking at the 14700K, uh, depending, and I wound up with an AMD 7900, so depending on which one you looked at, I mean, there were certain workloads, one did better than the other mm-hmm. and whatnot, and, but uh, it was one of them that ate itself. The 14700 and the 900 both were eating themselves. Now, the 900 was worse, mm-hmm. but the 700 was still in there, so I could have dodged a bullet. The, the same the same the same customer of mine that wanted to uh, run their their proprietary software on the M1 Mac also have a pair of computers from a very large a very large vendor, and uh, we are still fighting with them to try to get them to RMA those computers that have dying Intel chips from exactly that. And they, and they are dying. A, they're blue screening, mm-hmm. and that's the only thing oh. we can figure out that would cause it. Yes, yeah, I, I think. I think the last email we got, the vendor did finally admit that, yeah, that's probably what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Like, thanks, you yeah. couldn't have figured this out a year ago and gone ahead and replaced it then? Yeah, it's it's only in all the headlines. Well, but they couldn't have because even if they replaced it, they still had some of the faulty microcode. They had a lot of yeah. other problems. So it's only been in the last, was it month, two months, that they actually have. The most. Yeah, pretty recently. Yeah, the, the fixes in there, and there were several different fixes. Boy, and they, a- they had that oxidation problem in there, too. So they, they've had a rough go here lately. So, mm-hmm. And kind of a side note here, the little editorial, I'm kind of a little concerned about the latest chips coming out because they're already talking about the generation after that. So I'm wondering if these are going to be kind of like the AMD chips where, oh, look, we, we have way more efficient chips. It takes half the power, but it's 5% faster or 7% faster. And... People are just kind of going to go, well, I don't care about that. And everybody's already looking to the next generation. It's a, it's a tick instead of a talk. Yeah. Right. That's what Intel, that's what Intel used to do. They used to intentionally do that. They were on what they called a tick tock schedule. And so they would have a, a revision and then a big, big rebuild and then a revision and a big rebuild. Um, and it, and it helps actually the development because sure. you don't want to shrink your brand new design if you can help it because Mm-hmm. Even having a standard design and then shrinking it, you're going to run into problems because of the geometry and the processing mm-hmm. that you're doing at that tighter geometry and the smaller geometry. So if you can take the design issues away from the shrinkage issues, you know, you kind of just spread the love out a little more on problem solving and it kind of makes a smoother pipeline. So that's a lot of times why they do that. Would any... Generation, they add the things in the next generation is where they shrink it down yeah yeah, yeah. quite literally so so you have the new logic on the same process node as the last generation and then after you have that all worked out and the logic's good it works and plus you can then put in some improvements like oh we we designed this bus but we should have changed this circuitry so that we can have a little faster interface and then you shrink it you haven't made any major you know you're not overhauling the chip like you 
you did from the last generation, but you refine it and then you can shrink it because most of your problems then are going to be process related, not design related, not yeah. logic design. I mean, you could have features that are too small, things that are too close mm -hmm. that you have to change because, because of the shrinkage. But I mean, your, your, your design, how it works is solid. Yeah. Yeah. If it's that makes getting, sense. Uh, interference from the electronics <laughs> that's right next to it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big part of it. Oh, yeah. Um, it boy, becomes get, a big deal. Just think about that. Like, just just even a couple of years ago, but say three or four years ago, would you really have thought that AMD and NVIDIA are the ones killing it and people are worried about Intel? Like, man, that's such I, a departure. I especially never would have. owning Intel stock right now, right? Oh, yeah, especially those people. But, I mean, you know, people, we've got somebody talking in the, uh, uh, in the in our Discord right now about how, like, this Intel's in trouble and there are, there are things happening. It's like Intel is not having a good time right now. And there are some things happening. Uh, I, goodness. I don't know. Is they're in trouble? I mean, cause they, they've got so much money in the bank. They've got, they're so big. I mean, they could be in trouble for a long time before they're really <laughs> in trouble. Well, yes, that's but, true. <laughs> but I think now is kind of the, the watershed moment where they're going to have to really, and they've kind of been working on it. It's like, okay, we, you've got to double down on the technology. You've mm -hmm. got to really look at what you're doing. I mean, the last CEO, it, it kind of interestingly, he went to a different company. And when he got hired on, they were bragging him up and there was such a backlash against mm -hmm. him that uh, they had to disable comments and had to, I mean, it, people wow. were, and they deleted them, the comments, because they blamed him for Intel's failure, setting it up of, you know, not pushing the technology, just making a bunch of bad decisions. And now, now they're looking at, you know, splitting up their fabs like AMD did. Mm -hmm. AMD used to have fabs. They split them off into global foundries. And now AMD proper is just a design house. Yeah. They don't have the fabs. And Intel's kind of looking to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And here I thought but, was thinking about starting that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. They're already uh I don't know if it's a done deal yet or not, but they're if if not, it's seriously being looked at. Hmm. And and yeah, the company I work for, which you know. Just a little little company. I mean, well, we're global, but our market cap <laughs> little, little is compared to Intel. Little compared to Intel, and our market cap is way bigger than Intel. And if huh. you would have told me that ten years ago, I'm like, dude, get help, stop drinking, stop doing drugs. You know, just <laughs> you need some medicine. You need to, you know. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and and yeah. They're, they're way bigger. The, the amount of fabs that they have versus the company I work for, it's not even a competition. You know, it's, they're, the, they're still the 800 pound gorilla as far as what they physically own. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to some command line tips. And uh, we're going to let Ken go first. And uh, Ken, you either have something about checking the path or someone sneezed into the command line. I'm guessing we're checking the path. Yes. <laughs> now, what Jonathan's talking about is actually another core utility. It's P-A-T-H-C-H-K. Let me go ahead and bring up my command line here. Uh, I actually just go ahead and pronounce it path check. Since it checks paths and files to see if they will work on most POSIX systems. It is a great tool for checking the portability of path and files before you try creating them. Yes, I said before creating them. For example, here I am in my temp directory. And as there's the file directories that are inside that, I am going to do a quick uh, check for this path using path check. Uh, for those listening, I've just typed in path check space A slash B slash C. And if everything's good, you won't get anything back, which is what just happened when I hit enter. And so this indicates that this path has no portability problems within Linux itself, or at least in my case, Ubuntu 24.04. 
Now, you can have some flags that you can use. Uh, one is a slash capital P. And here I'm going to uh, type in another command, slash capital P, this time followed by a slash B slash dash B slash C. And when I hit enter, it comes back saying that it has a leading dash in a component of the file name. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the portability checks that you can do. It also uh, will check for uh, if you have a space character in it, which can affect the portability issues. And I bet you all that are watching were wondering how quickly I can type that. <laughs> but with the and this is the lowercase p it checks for that in, for that space uh, those listening what i've got is path check space dash lowercase p and then in quotes a b c d e f g h i j k l m n p o z <laughs> slash d e dash b c d e f g i l a k m <laughs> slash f space c and then of course the end quotes and it, a response to when i hit enter is path check non-portable character and then it has the uh, single quotes around an uh, empty space and file name and i'm not going to repeat all that for you thank you <laughs> now yeah. you can actually combine both to do a portability check or you can use dash dash portability for example let's go ahead and get that space out of there and see what else it finds when i do slash lowercase p uppercase p and now it tells uh, gives us a message that the limit uh, is exceeded. The limit that POSIX puts is 14. In this case, it's exceeded by a length of 26. And you can guess which part that has. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and shorten that part so that it stops at K. And then you've got the other part after the slash is exceeded by a length of uh, 15. So let's get rid of the DE that that part starts with. And yes, yeah, who complains about the, the dash? <laughs> uh. And we get rid of that dash, and then it's fully portable. Yeah. And uh. all without having to actually create that directory. Yeah, that, that can be, that's useful. Um, I, I had a uh, I had an issue a, a mysterious issue that I had to go solve about a week ago. And someone was like, "I create this file, and then when I try to open it, it says it doesn't have permissions to open it." And I got to looking at it, and I looked at the file name, and I looked at the folder name, and it was like very long folder inside a very long named folder inside a very long named folder, and then looked at the file name itself, and it's another very very long file name. It's like. I bet this application has a 255 character limit and go looking at it. And sure enough, that's what it was. They, they, this, this had been months that she had been having this problem with various files and we just couldn't figure it out. And finally I looked at it and I'm like, that's a long name. I bet that's what's going on there. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see, Jeff, you want to take it and talk about, uh, well, this is, this is the second part of your disabling package updates. All right, take it away. Yes, it is. Well, you know, if I'm given, you know, the Red Hat, you know, yum, DNF, some love. I, I got to give my old boy app some love too. you know, I'm, I'm Debian at heart, but, you know, I try, I try to show everybody some love. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about, last week we talked about holding back packages or even entire repositories from updating. If for some reason you didn't want a package or several packages to update, there can be many reasons for this. Like maybe there's a new version of a program, but it isn't compatible with something else in your system. For example, maybe there's some library collisions. It can happen. So 
the specifics last week for were for Yum and DNF, which is like Red Hat and uh, I think SUSE as well. And this week we're hitting the Debian side of the house and APT. So the first method, if you look at the article, is using apt mark, which is used with the hold and unhold options. Hold does what you what it says. It takes a package and it won't let it in be installed. If it is it if it is installed, it won't allow it to be upgraded or removed. Unhold removes the hold, and the package then can be just treated like any other package. Uh, you can use the apt mark show hold option. So it's app dash mark space show hold, no spaces option to see what packages are being held. So maybe you've been playing around with it and go, wait a minute, do I still have this on hold or not? That'll show you how to, how to take care of it. The second method is blocking package updates using the apt preferences file. You create a no updates file and list the programs you want to put a hold on. I'll let the listener get some details on that because there are some options you can set in the file as well, which dictate how the hold is handled, how it can be customized with several different options. There's some priority uh, ranking in there of when it can, you know, what can override it, what won't override it. So the article goes into some nice detail about on all the different customizations you can do and kind of a little too much for just uh, a command line segment. The third way is using the auto remove preference file so it won't let it be removed so it can't be updated because it needs to remove to put the new version in. And the fourth way, <clears throat> excuse me, is by blacklisting the package sources list. Now this will stop updates from the entire repository. So probably not something anyone wants to do unless you have a third party repository that is specific to a single package and supporting files like Maybe the the Chrome repository, for example. Yeah, I just want to lock it in, and which I would, I don't advise because you know security updates and all that. And well, I run Firefox anyway. But <laughs> point point, you know, but something like that where you have a repository that's specific to a single, you know, you don't, you don't want to pick one of the main ones and just not update half of your system. So only only use that if you really know what you're doing. And the fifth and final way is when you manually update the software in your sudo apt upgrade, use the no upgrade option. So with the name of the package, you don't want to want it change that you don't want changed. So for example, your command line might look like sudo space apt space upgrade space dash dash no dash upgrade space uh, Apache two which would then upgrade everything except Apache 2. Mm -hmm. So take a look at the article linked in the show notes for all the details and specifics on locking a package and happy updating. Yeah, so Keith, uh, Keith512 in the Discord chat has a, a, pretty clever, um, a pretty clever idea here, and that is that you can, uh, you can do apt mark unhold and then a space and then the dollar sign parentheses to, you know, you run another command and they get the output and you can just run the apt, the apt mark show hold command there. And that'll let you go through and unhold everything, which is uh, it definitely a pretty interesting way to go about that. Yeah. That's, and that's a good idea of if you have, uh, you're, Oh, I got a lot of them. I got to unhold and <clears throat> you don't have to put them in individually. So yeah, yep. good job. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to talk very, very briefly about Netcat, which is uh, kind of a Swiss Army chainsaw of doing stuff with the network. And uh, mine is is really, really trivial, what we're doing with Netcat. And uh, that is we're sending a packet with it. Um, and so I've got, I, I don't remember if I mentioned this last week on the show, but I've got a new bamboo mini printer over, over that way and, uh, been doing a little bit of printing with it and had a lot of fun with it. Um, the, the software, the bamboo lab software that you run on Linux, while it's open source and it's great that they open sourced it, uh, it has some pain points and thanks to, I think it was in, in our discord. One of the things someone said when I mentioned that I was getting it really, it got me thinking that, oh, I should probably make sure and have that on a segregated network. And so I've got it on my guest network and then I've got my desktop can only get in through to it. 
Well, when you do all that, you make things like your your MDNS, so your your autoconf stuff, the the automatic configuration things, uh, will tend to no longer work because you're not on the same network. And in the software, in the slicing software, it does not have a field to just give it an IP address. You can't say, "Hey, Bamboo Labs, here's the IP address of the printer. Go talk to it." It doesn't work that way. So what it does is it's waiting for one of these special MDNS packets to come in. It's, this took me a while to figure out how to do it. And the answer is, and I don't have the whole thing here. I just have a snippet from it. But you can run a netcat command. You So you, what you do is you echo your, and your string is going to be something like, you know, HTTP slash 1.1, 200 OK, and then the rest of it. You pipe that into NC, which is netcat, and you just say, send this. In my case, it's UDP. Here's the IP address. And then you give it the right port number at the end. And so it's using Netcat, just like this, this little connect point A to point B across the network. Um, super useful for this and a whole bunch of other things. Like the, the, the sky is the limit with Netcat. I think I could do probably a month or two's worth of tips on just Netcat. Um, but I've got a link to it, to, to some more information on Netcat, some of the fun things you can do with it. And it is definitely a tool to have in your toolbox. Um, yeah, good stuff. All right. I think we have covered the uh, the stories and the tips. We're going to let each of the guys get in whatever they want to plug here at the end. We'll let Ken go first. Well, I want to go back to my command line tip. I do recommend uh, looking in the show notes, a uh, link to an article by Robert Arrow Elder uh, that also goes over some things I didn't touch on as far as using path check. Uh-huh. Also, I do want to ask, if you like doubling your money and getting swag, then I do <laughs> recommend reading the Phosphorus article I've got linked at down under the ending notes in the show, in our show notes. Uh, uh, then after you've read it, share it with someone. All right. Tor is looking to raise money. Yeah, good to know. All right, uh, Jeff, anything you want to plug? Yeah, I got I got something. So sorry, no poetry this week. But <laughs> you can catch me on this week's Floss, or this past week's Floss Weekly episode, 805 Mastodon, Bring Your Own Algorithm. So Jonathan and I talked to Andy Piper from Mastodon and mm-hmm. had a wonderful conversation. And especially if you're not really into Mastodon or you're not quite sure about it, I would say check it out because I didn't know a lot about it either. So I've got some of those basic questions and Andy did a great job of talking about it and where to go, how to get started. And I was going to plug, I've got a Mastodon now, but I'm still waiting for the approval on twit.social. So otherwise I'd say, yes, you can find me at, you know, I'd have a cute, cute Rob segue thing, but. Alas, I have not approved yet. So, <laughs> do you know what your handle is going to be? Uh, I think it's just Jeff Massey at twit.social. Okay, we will we will watch for it, and as soon as that gets approved, as soon as somebody realizes that there is a a request waiting for them to go punch the button on, uh, I'm sure yeah, that's I, all it is. Yeah, I figure I figure in a few days if it hits a, when it hits a week, I'll just go. Hey, you know, uh, Leah moved that server but into the house. Or it's on a Could, VM somewhere, you know, maybe it's DigitalOcean, one of our sponsors. I think they're still a sponsor. They've been a sponsor, at least. You know, it may be on DigitalOcean or maybe on AWS, or maybe it's in the house. Who knows? Or worst comes to worst, if if nobody gets to it, I'll just go over to hackaday.social and I'll go hang out over there. That works. Yeah, that's the cool thing about Mastodon. Doesn't, it doesn't matter all that much which server you're on. Um, although we did, we, there was a, so obviously we posted the links and Andy posted the links to Mastodon and people were talking about it. And one of the things that, that kind of humored me that uh, people talked about about it is like, you guys sort of downplayed which server you should be on. And some people, because they are often targets of harassment, really need to be careful about what server that they get on. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's probably fair. Um uh, that's not something that like uh, everybody needs to worry about. But if if that is if that is something like if you have a let's see how should I put this uh, if you either have problems with it or have a very low tolerance for a, a lack of moderation, then yes, do be very careful about which Mastodon server that you jump on. Um, so that is or, fair to point out yeah. to people or run up and, your own 
Or, well, if if the lack of moderation is what you're worried about, then hosting your own is probably not going to help. Because <laughs> then <laughs> it's all you, man. All that moderation is on you. Um, but if if over moderation is something that really drives you nuts, then yes, host your own, and that will absolutely solve that problem for you. And that's like that's the thing I, I, <clears throat> I love about Mastodon is if you get to control your own experience. You're not at the whims of anybody. You're not at the whims of, so like on Reddit, you're at the whims of the Reddit administrator for whatever group you're a part of and the, the corporate structure of Reddit itself. On Twitter, you're at the whims of the people running Twitter. Whether you like them or not, you're still at their whims. At Facebook, every other social media platform. But on Mastodon, you can literally host it yourself and you are in charge of your own destiny. And it's just the coolest that's, thing. That's why, that's why the title is Bring Your Own Algorithm. Mm-hmm. That's what it was you're about. In, you're in charge. Or harassment wise, just do like I do and not be famous. And then it just, you know, <laughs> you just fly under the radar. It's okay. It can be safer sometimes. Yes, that's yeah. true. Uh, all right. Thank you guys both for being here so much. I appreciate it very, very much. I will mention Hackaday right over there. We've got the security column goes live Friday mornings. And of course, Floss Weekly live on Tuesday. And the article gets posted on Wednesdays. And then, of course, if you're not a part of it, you should you should scan the QR code and join the club. Get in to Club Twit. It's about the price of a cup of coffee per month, and it is definitely worth it. You get access, well, to the video of this show, if you don't have that already. You get the ad-free version of the shows. You get ad- access to the Discord, uh, and it's, you get to show your support for Twit, and uh, that is definitely well worth it. So join the club. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here, and we will see you next week on the Untitled Linux Show. Mm-hmm.